Hi, I see that one viewer just joined. And I want to encourage you to find the link to actually join as a presenter so that we can see each other's video. So check the open hour page, publiclab.org slash wiki slash open hour. And look for the, scroll down and look for a button that says join the call live. Click that button and that should put you in here with video. I see that there are two viewers in here, and I want you to, to. I want to encourage you to actually join as participants, and you can do that by um, going to the open hour page and clicking the link to join the call live. Um, let me see if I can put that somewhere. I'll I'll put it here in the group chat. Should be the direct link. I'll also put it in the chat room. And if you have any trouble, send additional trouble, send me a text with this phone number that I just put into Google Chat, which is um, should be on the you may be seeing it on the side of your page, 336-269-1539. Hey. Hey, Liz. Hi, Simon. Hey. Even Amara is here to say hi. 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 Hey, Amara. Oh. Hey. Okay. Good to see you. How, who, who have we got today? So Tom Levine and Jeremy Barron are joining or trying to join right now. I've got them in the chat room, but they're not on the video yet. So we're just getting, we're just getting warmed up. Okay, cool. All right. Ooh, meeting digital. Yeah, look, Amara, join public lab and you'll meet, learn, learn to use all of these super Um, I already, I used them when I was nine. <laughs> this Me, is a problem. I, Google Plus is so old. I use that already. What did, what would you prefer that we use, Amara? No, I mean, Google Plus is good for, like, calls and stuff. Oh. I, I just don't usually. I, I used to I, when I got when I used it. I got so I got so excited. I was like, oh my god! And we and on my little iPod, we would like um, do video calls just like that, except with like three people. So I don't I don't use Google Plus anymore. But it's a cool system. All right. So, Someone else joined. Oh yeah. Um, from looks like Africa or somewhere there. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, RJ Steiner. It could, be, it could be utterly misleading, of course, just because. <laughs> of... That was actually a picture from last year. I was uh, working in some schools in Africa. Okay. Wait, uh, why why isn't he on video? I you know I I'm trying to get that working right now. Uh, it's, it's telling me about settings of some some sort. I'm RJ, by the way. RJ, I'm Iman, and I guess Liz, this is Amara, and uh, we're in Brooklyn, Hi. New York, Kiwanis uh, area. Liz is frozen. Are you frozen? No, she's not frozen. She's just staying really, really still. <laughs> Liz. Hey, Liz. Hi, Amara. Hi, RJ. Oh, oh Jesus. You just, because uh, I thought you were frozen, and I was like, hey, hey Tom and Jeremy. So life's good here. We're getting a lot of good go. positive positive feedback on the 
CSI creek scene investigation articles. So I'm getting a whole bunch of emails from people around the, the neighborhood and watershed who want to start other projects and uh, more research. So there'll be more public lab spin-offs from that. These are just to put people in the context, these are water quality research projects we're doing on historical streams in our neighborhood. And we're basically going around to anyone who has an old stream in their basement and talking to them about the history of their uh, flooding problems and finding out where stuff goes and what can be done about it. Hey, Dad! Where's the guacamole? Guacamole, I ate it. It was awful. Excuse me? Well, this is a conference, professional conference call. <laughs> So I'm putting, I just put the link to the article I'm speaking of in the chat, uh, the, the Hangout chat, and also in our real chat room, um, because he just got a profile, essentially, of his research written up in the New York Times this past week. It's really incredible. Cool. When, one spin-off that we had, everything comes full circle. Remember the, the meeting you organized to go photograph Lookout Hill? where we, were, we had a group of architects who wanted to conceptualize what this theoretical tower would look like uh, in terms of the view from the highest point in Brooklyn. Yeah. And the spin-off is, is that at the base of that mountain is one of the biggest well shafts in New York City. So the, uh, the water for Prospect Park used to be regulated by this really deep well that provided water for all the water features. So it was a natural artesian well. But over the years, <laughs> sorry, family aside, the, Sim the Simpsons are in the shelf on the Thank bottom you. side. So, the, sorry, sorry for that little domestic aside. And so the issue is, is that this well used to tap natural uh, water from the uh, Janeco Aquifer. That's sort of a big lens of water underneath here. But then it became so polluted in the 50s and 70s that the city switched from natural well water um, and then started using fresh water from the city mains. And one of the weirdnesses about that is that water from the city mains has phosphates in it so the, to keep lead from leaching out of the pipes. And so the spin-off is, is that all the lakes of Prospect Park are now cover, covered with green uh, scum or duckweed or algae. So that is a water quality issue, but I'm just showing how the technology has changed because now they've stopped using the natural spring water, which they divide, they are diverting to the combined sewers, you know, when it overflows, and instead they're using city main water, which has got added phosphates in it, um, which is causing extra water pollution in our ornamental ponds. So I'm just giving that as an example of like an extra spin-off project that came out of that article because someone just emailed me this thing. So, you know, what do you know about the switch over to the water from the historical water source to the pipe water source and all of the side impacts? So that may be a project we'll sniff around that over the years mm -hmm. to figure out exactly where the historical well water is now going and whether we shouldn't switch back to it. So that's just a spin-off, but... Volume! Sorry. Turn ah. off the volume, please. What? Volume. Oh, so I'm wondering if... Uh, I mean, that that's incredible, Emin, and I bet people have questions, but I just wanted to take a minute that because, you know, we're here on a holiday, and this is the first of these open hours that's been small enough that we can easily talk directly to each other. I just wanted to make sure that we've done introductions and I can say that, um, well, I'm Liz and I think I know every, all of you. Um, and this is the first time I'm hosting a Google Hangout, so that's interesting. Um, and I'm really excited for you all to meet each other, so I wonder if you might sort of say where you're from and. Um, some of your main research interests, and maybe we could find some uh, common ground uh, we could talk about. Sure. Okay, go ahead. I, yeah, I can, I can go first. Okay. Um, my name is RJ Steiner. I've been involved with Public Lab since, um, since before Public Lab was Public Lab, I guess. Um, 
I've, in the past few years, I've been involved with um, a lot of farming projects, and uh, particularly, uh, I've been working on some alert systems this summer for farms, uh, for farmers who are looking to find out if their greenhouses are too hot or too cold, or if their refrigerators are too hot or too cold. Um, so there's this project that I've been working on called Fido, um, and uh, it's just a little uh, Raspberry Pi computer with a USB temperature sensor connected to it. And we wrote some software that um, broadcasts a little website on the local area networks over Wi-Fi and uh, lets you program it so to uh, send you a text message when you hit like the high or low. That's that's the work that I do. Cool. Cool. Now your group is called your additional group is Farm Hack, right? Yep. Yep. I help start a, um, a community called Farm Hack. Um, so. It was really influenced from a lot of stuff that was going on in Public Lab. Um, and I happened to run into this big group of folks who were really interested in farming and open source. And so we started a community. Um, we started doing events all around the country where we were doing brainstorms um, around uh, problems that farmers were having and how we might be able to bring engineers in and solve those problems. Um, and solve them as open source solutions. And so actually the FIDO thing that I talked about was uh, inspired by a farmer that I met at one of those events who had a bunch of, who had his greenhouse get too hot one, one spring day. It was just an abnormally hot day and there was supposed to be somebody there to get it, uh, to open the doors if it got too hot. Uh, that person wasn't able to make it that day and he lost all of his starters that season, uh, just that one afternoon. And so... Wow. These, uh, these alarm systems are um, uh, something that has traditionally been pretty expensive for farmers. And uh, so we're helping bring the cost down and also doing it um, and also opening up the possibilities of what they can do uh, because we're doing it in an open source way. That's actually really interesting. So it's like an instant an alert system geared toward atmospheric conditions, in other words, is uh, the primary focus, right? Humidity, heat. Yeah, so there's lots of factors that we can monitor. Um, for simplicity's sake, we've been just perfecting the temperature part. So we just want to make it really, really easy for folks uh, who are concerned about temperature to be able to uh, monitor that. Um, we're using, um, we actually just, we may be opening up new possibilities with what we can monitor because we're using uh, now the Grove sensor platform, which is uh, these plug and play sensors. Um, that can do humidity or dust concentrations or um, uh, conductivity, uh, soil moisture, all sorts of things. And uh, so... Wow. Conductivity and soil moisture gets very complicated. Yeah. Uh, well, so we don't have to design the sensors. Luckily, there's lots of great sensors on the Grove platform. So the uh, Grove the list of sensors is right here. Okay, seed. Oh, it's already carried by Seed Studio. Yeah, it's a seed project. Uh, um, so it's a shield that you put on top of the Raspberry Pi that allows you to just connect uh, these uh, sensors. Just they just snap in. So it's kind of like it's kind of like they took. They just have this common interface on top of shield that and on top of the Raspberry Pi, and then they just you know uh, print a board with the circuit uh, with all the circuits they need to interface with that board. Um, along with the sensor. Wow. The, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, we're actually hoping uh, to, we're, we're working on uh, gearing up right now to uh, start selling kits for these things. Um, awesome. Yeah, in the public lab store of all places. <laughs> Hey, that is awesome. So so you're working with the KITS initiative team? We are. I'm working with Natalie right now. Um, That's awesome. And my, and my partner Doogie is in Portland, Oregon right now um, uh, awesome. showing, showing Natalie one of the FIDOs. Oh, it's called FIDO. Yes. Not, yes. That, I've definitely seen the emails about FIDO. I, I just, when you said Grove, it didn't ring a bell, but yeah, now, now I'm with you. That, yeah. That's fantastic. And, um, uh, all right, I want to I wanna go back and ask you about some other neat, 
neat overlaps between with Farm Hack and Public Lab, but I feel like we should keep going around. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm in. Uh, I'm in, in Gowanus, Brooklyn. I, I'm helping out with the Gowanus Canal Conservancy with their uh, low altitude mapping program, which uses the public lab uh, aerial imaging tools, and we're focused on. Uh, looking at vegetation changes around an industrial superfund site that's a waterway in um, Brooklyn and looking at tests that we're running for different types of ecosystems that we're planting and using the aerial photography to keep track uh, of what works and what doesn't. One spin-off which uh, has happened from that is part of the aerial photographs have allowed us to find out a lot more about water quality issues and not just water quality issues present but historical ones, so we're focusing now on using it for archaeological research to reconstruct the historical ecosystem that drives a lot of the changes in the watershed. And that's become what's called the Gowanus CSI project, which is Creek Scene Investigation. And so we've basically reconstructed the whole historical watercourse system for our heavily urbanized watershed and are now looking for opportunities for stream restoration or uh, water quality restoration projects, and that'll spin off into some of the other public lab uh, water quality tools. Cool. Um, I'm in, uh, maybe you could, well actually, I, let, let's come back. I'd love to hear a recap from you on how um, the evening with you, Kaya, and the thermal fishing bob went. But we'll come back. Okay. Um, Jeremy and Tom, are you there? You're muted out, but I we are chatting in the other window, so I think you are there. Come back, Jeremy B. Your turn to introduce yourself. <laughs> we see another head. Night. Hello, oh, other head. Uh, Jeremy, say something. Uh, no audio. Okay. Oh, boo! I can kick in with um, Kaya's work right now. I'm wait, 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 wait. We gotta do. We hold on, hold on. We gotta introduce. Okay. Introduce Jeremy Barron and Tom Levine, and um, this is where I'm gonna slightly botch their introductions, but um, these. These are two people who are um, super important to to public lab and to open source in general. Um, Jeremy's actually um, it's great anytime he hangs out with public lab because I think his main love is um, Wikipedia, where he's a he's an editor and an active member in the Northeast. Um, he's brought <laughs> many he, he's kind of bringing the culture of Wikipedia um, to public lab as I think of it. Um, Jeremy can correct me as soon as you fix your mic. Um, <laughs> and um, he is also a long-term um, environmental activist, and he um, particularly loves going up to the Clearwater Festival. And so he um, and, actually, and Charles Stewart actually um, team member. Oh, in fact, he's wearing a shirt right now. But that's not why I remembered to say that. I just knew that. Um, and he's trying to get Public Lab more involved um, with that festival, with that event. Tom, who has, who currently has pink hair, but you never really know what Tom may or may not be looking like. Um, <laughs> Tom, I first met Tom because of the work he did with Scott Eustace in the Gulf Coast, setting up, a, and maybe RJ, maybe you know Tom, I'm not sure, um, but Tom has worked in many different open source communities from Scraper Wiki to Open Knowledge Foundation to I don't even know who, um, but I first met him um, when he helped the Gulf Restoration Network set up a scraper to pull permits off of the Army Corps of Engineers website, which is super like obfuscated and um, impossible for any citizen watchdog to keep track of what is going to be built where, and to get ahead of that in time to actually, um, you know, go to public hearings and try to influence it with better science. 
Um, Tom is currently in New York City, um, so that's great. And um, he does a lot of other things, as you can imagine. Um, so until their mic comes back on, that is going to be um, <laughs> what has to stand. I see in the chat room that they're trying some other devices. Um, but maybe while they're getting ready to um, get their sound back and correct everything I just said, um, Iman can go about um, the thermal fishing bob. So the thermal fishing bulb is essentially a way of measuring temperature fluctuations uh, in polluted water conditions where there may be variable temperatures from things like sewers, industrial outfalls, and or positives like freshwater springs and creeks. So it turns out that sewer coming into a uh, body of water will be slightly warmer, or a creek uh, which has been warmed by the uplands will be slightly warmer. And these are non-visible things. The color of the water is the same, but the only way to detect it seeping into a bulwark or behind a concealed facade is through a minor temperature fluctuation. So Kaya Simmons has successfully tested the Arduino-based uh, thermal fishing bob up at the, one of the nuclear plants up near Boston and uh, shown that you can effectively paint the water with different rainbow colors based on fluctuations in the temperature in the water. So giving them these very appealing graphics of not necessarily pollution, but fluctuations along a shoreline that can have meaningful scientific data, that this is the spot where the stuff's coming in. So because we have an industrial canal, which is mostly with steel bulwarks with rusty holes, and it's sometimes difficult to see where stuff is coming in from, this is sort of the perfect technology for us to actually see um, where seepages are happening that give us clues for springs that we may, or streams that we want to then track upland. So we went out, I think, last week to test it, and we did get some successful tests uh, with the construction uh, from a big apartment building that burst some of the water mains there. So there's city water coming into the canal. And we did get temper temperature fluctuations just from uh, that inflow. Uh, but the, okay. the quick truth that we come up, come up with is that electronics and water don't mix very well, and especially yeah. physical sh shaking conditions. And so one of the immediate uh, things that we concluded is the, uh, the uh, Arduino setup, we have to weld all of the wires in place. Because the minute you start rattling it around, one or two of the wires will pop. So that's one of the things that we have to do in that for, the, for our next round, is we have to do with, with a fully, fully welded unit. Like you, you, know, you can shake, and it doesn't disconnect. Because what invariably happens is when you go out in the field, and you're paddling around, and you toss it in, there'll be a wire getting loose in a sealed plastic container that's impossible to access. So it's you know, really important that this thing is kick-proof. And then the other key thing that we figured out was that we need to be able to easily change the calibration range. So it turns out that the temperature fluctuations are not in four or five degree variations, unless it's like someone's pouring a huge bucket of really hot water into the canal. It's usually in quarter of a degree. So it's like half a degree fluctuation. So you have to be able to calibrate on the fly uh, the colors to be able to change between you know, 50 degrees to 53 degrees in one scenario, but 70 to 72 degrees in another scenario. So we need to figure out a way to quickly adjust the Arduino calibration in a condition where it's raining and you're in a canoe. So that's the, those were the two sort of technical lessons we picked up from that. But we did identify one perfect site that we're going to use for a media event because we have a, a stream coming in underneath a bridge that's very photogenic and it'll be the perfect spot. Rainbow light painting of the canal site. And then we'll be running new tests probably in a, uh, next week when our Kaya comes back down. Um, can someone else mute while they're using speakers, just because of the feedback? A minute. OK, great. Um, this is super interesting to hear, Ivan. And, and actually, um, I was hoping I would get Kaya on the phone tonight as well. There is, to support Kaya's work on the thermal fishing bob, there are some very interesting um, 
work being done um, in the open water group, a group that's specifically about getting sensors ready for water. And I, I just threw in the group chat a link to something called the Thermal Fishing Club. And I apologize because I didn't put any pictures. But essentially, um, Don and Catherine up at um, MIT and UMass Amherst have a way to make a sensor in a bottle, AKA watertight, for less than $5 that has the functionality that Kaya has expressed in his prototype. And so actually the next version of the tool is ready to go. We just have to like get a work session and get you know the people from Boston explaining how can we build it down here and, and get ourselves some here. So it's, it's good to know the next sort of version is already in the pipeline, if you will, because uh, it's the water sensor. Yeah. The, the one thing to keep in mind is, of course, what's sealed isn't accessible in the field. So this is the, the tricky part, is how, if you want to do make a change on the fly, how do we do it? So that's the scratch your head logistical scenario that we have, where we realize, whoops, we need to get into this watertight container, and it's raining. Uh, how, do we, how, how do we do it? Right. It's, uh, Why so that, is it always raining? That's like... Uh, the, 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 this, this is the technical challenge. The most interesting data is precisely under the most adverse conditions. In the case of water quality study, you want the most horrific storm because that's when the good stuff starts. I mean, literally, the shit hits the fan. That's when the uh, sewers overflow. That's when the streams start flowing. That's where all of the good you know, visual data becomes available. But it's also the most technically adverse conditions. In terms of, you know, certainly if we're trying to use Glow Doodle with a laptop with pouring rain, it, it gets iffy very fast. Yeah. Liz, I wish uh, my camera was working right now. I think I have uh, what you're talking about in my hand uh, with the next Riffle iteration. Oh, really? You have one right there? Is it in a bottle? Yeah. I'm at I'm at the pirate ship right now, so. Oh, sweet. It happens to be sitting on the table here. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, it has does, a smiley does, does the Ripple unit require any on-the-fly calibration, or it's all set ready to go, right? I, I, wish I, I wish I knew more. I haven't seen Don in a little while. I've been away at a farm all summer. <laughs> so, uh, Liz, do you, know, do you know much about the project? I don't know. I don't know where the riffle is at. Um, it was actually Jeff who alerted me to the fact that they had basically been inspired by all the work done on on the functionality needed on thermal fishing bob and got to making a more efficient efficient second version of it. So um, I, I know that Don is pretty handy with designing circuits these days. Um, he's been going through a lot of iterations on his boards, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I see that Iman just posted another awesome article, but I'm wondering if we could hold on that um, because I think we've got our other guys back with um, they're online with another device. Maybe uh, can we hear from you guys now? Yeah, you can hear us, right? Yeah. yeah. Your introduction was decent. I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't hear the whole thing, but yeah, probably was our back. Oh, right, this is the device. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, but they can see us too. <laughs> anyway, all right. You don't want to say anything else? Um. Yeah, uh, the, I haven't been working on stuff related to like environment lately, have I? No, mm, well, I guess not really. But um, is there anyone? Has anyone been asking you for for stuff in public lab? Could I be aware that like people are expressing needs to you that maybe didn't that I don't know about and should try expressing to help needs you? to me, except for Doogie, who needed who needed a a hip like a uh, video thing for the party to, to 
to, to say how much we like Market Basket. And that was cool. That was cool. Um, I can show you have pictures of that. Or you can just install it. I think it's just, if you have Python, you can just install it and then run it. And then you get, it, well, I'll just tell you what it does. It, uh, it flashes um, items from the circular, from the Market Basket circular on the screen in ASCII um, fonts, like um, in like, the, the, uh, the letters are made up a bunch of small letters in different colors, and uh, you, can, you can play it with the music. Wow. So uh, it looks like they're back at work, by the way. I don't, I don't know if uh, anyone's been following the Market Basket news. I haven't been following it. Uh, yeah, R RJ did the, 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 did the first version, kind of, because I didn't do it. I did the other. Did you see so, the thing we came up with? Okay. You guys is, yeah. <laughs> do you have Jeremy and Tom? Are, you, have you met RJ before, or have you met Ivan before? I have met everyone on this call. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Jeremy. I don't know about RJ, but otherwise, yes. Okay. Um, so I, so I'm gonna, um, I haven't forgotten about your article yet, Iman, uh, oh, wait, maybe we should do, okay, let's go back to Iman first, and then I still want to ask RJ about, um, some of the interesting community stuff that, uh, RJ is doing. Wait, what? Go ahead. Uh, you, you just got me thinking. You said, are people expressing needs to me? They aren't, but are, 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 should, like, should I say something so that people do express needs to me? If I mean, if you want to, if you wanted to do more environmental stuff, um, there is there's a developer list, although they mostly talk to each other and not so much like say, "Hi everyone, what are do you need any cool scraping, statistical processing, ASCII art, or other things that I do, etc." Okay. <laughs> but you could. What, what I need right now is I was walking along the street and we have the sewer manholes um, right in the middle of the road and sometimes when you put your ear to them you can hear water rushing by and sometimes it's sewage but sometimes it's a stream and I would love a device that I could just plug into my smartphone like a long little fishing rock, um, string with a little microphone at it that allows me to just drop it in through the hole of the manhole to record the decibel level of water rushing by and have like some kind of app that would allow me to calibrate right away what the standard sounds of okay. water Okay, so are. you just need a long microphone and then the calibration. Right, so and, and something that would be kid friendly because it would be something that kids would put on their smartphones and then they would get a reward for finding any sound that's above a certain rating. So I that was recordings. Perhaps we can mm -hmm. do something. Right. So that's what I'm going to be doing is trying to get this, the acoustic signatures of typical kind of uh, pipe water runs. And when they get when the flow gets above a certain level, it's no longer just sewage. It'll be like a full stream volume. And there's a, we've found several scenarios like that, and now we'd like to get more technical about it and say, yeah, this is definitely a, uh, a major arterial stream run that's buried underneath the street. And then the other, the other technical signature thing that we were looking for was a cheap way to measure oxygen um, through some kind of smartphone app or... I, I, I don't know enough about oxygen meters, but that's the new thing that's come up on my radar as something that I would really like to have access to cheap technology for uh, a low-cost oxygen meter. And it traditionally very expensive. Sorry? You mean oxygen in the air or oxygen in the water? Oxygen in the water. Right. So oh, it's, so the riffle, the riffle has that. Oh, it does. It's fabulous. Okay, Can you but confirm that it's dissolved oxygen? 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly where it's at. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's. I I think it's on. Um, well, here's a question. How do you how do you tip how do you typically um sense uh dissolved oxygen in water? What's this? Uh, you you we have a metal uh an, an expensive metal sensor uh that I remember I bought it from DEP and it's like five or six thousand bucks and then uh it, you just float it in the water and I think it's through electrostatic. Conductivity, or some—that's the science part that I don't understand. I'll have—I'm going to draw up the technical specs for the challenge, and then I'll put it out there. But I've just realized I need to find out more of how do you sense oxygen and dis dissolved oxygen in water in a cheap way. Mm. And right now, it's an expensive technical unit that um, physically looks like just a metal prod that you put in the water. Right now, I'm looking at uh, two nails going through a bottle cap. Um, that are uh, uh, attaching to uh, what are these called again? Uh, alligator clips mm -hmm. <clears throat> that then uh, run to two uh, leads on the the board itself. Okay. Uh, so I, I would imagine it's doing some kind of con conductivity reading. Right, and that that, is that are you describing the riffle scenario or just a theoretical scenario? No, describing describing what's in front of me right now, which might might be the newest iteration. Okay. <laughs> Reminds me of what we used to to, to uh, cook hot dogs in the dorm when we were crazy students. <laughs> nail and you put, put the hot dog between the two nails. <laughs> and let's plug, plug it in. Yeah, or or maybe this is this is a this is a cheap hot dog cooker. Like maybe this is a riffle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, it looks like I'm actually looking at the latest um, uh, sample file from a riffle. I'm throwing in Jeff Walker's, not Jeff Warren, but Jeff Walker's um, GitHub page here. It's um, not having dissolved oxygen yet, but I think that Leafs. I'm pretty sure that one of Leaf Persefield's old sensors had dissolved oxygen on it. So thanks for that reminder, Jeremy. We can ask him. As well. and the other physical criteria is because the test locations are often going to be people's sump pumps. The uh, physical space into which you will introduce the measurement instrument is probably under four inches diameter. So you know, roughly, roughly this. You know, this is going to be your test window here. So it's important that it be as compact as possible for, um, uh, you know, that we can just put it into a tight little space to get the reading. Just because of the way of the typical uh, site testing scenarios we'll be facing. We won't have a big, expansive open waterway in a lot of cases. Okay, this is super neat. So I mean, I'm just I'm just um, jotting down your two. Um, points into the chat room uh, so we don't lose it. So yeah, one's an acoustic sensor, the other one's a dissolved oxygen meter is sort of low cost uh, stream stream measurement hunting tools. Yeah, cool. Okay. Got it. Um Yeah, so I wonder when we can have a work session on this. So um, in terms of events coming up, September 21 is going to be a super busy time. Most of us New Yorkers are going to be at World Maker Fair, but I bet a lot of Boston, although I w was hoping they were going to come down here, now I see that Leaf Fest has been... They changed their date. They were going to be earlier in September, but they've changed their date to be the same weekend. So that's hard because we need people here in New York, but also because it would be a great opportunity for folks like I'm in to actually go to Leaf Fest and you know work in person with a bunch of developers. So we should we should try to figure that out. Yeah. So that's. That's so no. <laughs> I know. Did you, did you know about RJ that it had been switched? No, I didn't know that. <sighs> I'm going to look it up. 
Um, so this other thing happened today, and well, actually no, I still can't. I still can't ask RJ about that because I'm in. Um, you posted that newspaper article. Do you want to talk about the motherboard article? Uh, that that is uh, pretty much a repeat of the New York Times article, but the focus is more on the actual watershed mapping that we did. And what's interesting is it has a summary map of all the streams that we've mapped so far. There, if you click on the article, you'll see a couple of pretty pictures with kids in red balloons. But the meat of the matter is a map that shows in purple lines across the landscape and the building footprints where we think the old streams are based on a set of clues. And then what we do is now we go in and we zoom in on some branches uh, of the stream and try to refine the data as we go along. And that's uh, what we were doing in this particular article was looking at the spring heads at the tip of one of those uh, streamlines in Prospect Park. And as a result of that research now, I've had a whole bunch of property owners who are live near or adjacent to those purple lines uh, saying, hey, I've got this pump in my basement. You can physically see the stream. And so the good news is, A, the model's correct, like the set of clues that we're using for finding the streams, effectively identify them, and then we just can zoom in uh, to the people's basements and know, okay, it's exactly over here, and now we are setting up a Google Maps or public lab map system where we're starting to put field notes for whenever we go to the basements, and we are trying to collect substantive data about water temperature and oxygen and flow levels. So those are sort of new, that's something that's shown up this week that we would want to do. And uh, the density of the data collected from local community informants then creates not just the legs of the elephant, but you know, vision of the elephant as a whole, and then some policy directions for you know where what street should be prioritized in this case for project we're calling street creeks, where we're trying to get some of the major buried streams out from the sewer and back onto the surface sunlight, uh, where they can be used for irrigating tree pits or uh, reconstructing park water systems or uh, just play areas for kids uh, once certain public health criteria be met. Cool. One of the projects we're particularly interested in is called Play Pumps. And uh, essentially, one discovery was that uh, the city always gets the shittiest land, uh, the land that no one wants. And that's the land that floods. It's Farmer Brown's old uh, pot, duck pond that got landfilled in you know, 18, 19, 20 or whatever, and was always marshy and boggy, and no one wanted to build there. And that's where people say, hey, let's build the playground. So it turns out there's this extremely tight correlation between school playgrounds and schools and old buried farm ponds. And so these are turning out to be the perfect places to put um, stormwater holding systems or sewer overflow systems, but ideally rainwater systems, uh, that uh, when the storm has passed, we have specialized play equipment design called play pumps. So when the kids play, the water is pumped back out from uh, the tank and then back out into its surface stream system. And that's actually a tested uh, prototype that's been working in Africa uh, and uh, mainly for drinking water scenarios. And here we would be trying to adapt it for uh, urban, urban wastewater or urban runoff uh, management scenarios. And I've been getting some positive feedback on that as well. So that'll be, so we're trying to use some of the public lab tools to identify all potential play pump sites in our watershed, which essentially are um, playground type scenarios that have the proven characteristics of, yeah, we're hearing the flow right there in the street, playground's right here, let's make the two uh, connect in, into a win-win situation. Got it. So are your main projects coming out of this inquiry then, street creeks and play pumps? Yes, in terms of practical design implications. Yeah. Yes. And then the third project are uh, essentially uh, reconnections or reroutings. So where we have a, a clean stream that's been plugged into a major combined sewer, we want X marks a spot. This, this is really where you can disconnect a clean stream from a dirty sewer. So there's no reason for clean water to mix with dirty water. And so that's the, those are the ones that we're really focusing on is, 
um, trying to identify pipes that only have clean water before they mix with the dirty water so that we know that this is, you know, you dig one hole here, you reroute the water to this space, then you get X million gallons of sewers overflows uh, out of the system. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the ghost stream connectors would be really the, the third uh, third project. I'm just typing that. What did you say the ghost stream what? Ghost stream connectors. Or uh, I, I'll come up with a sexy name for it, but uh, it's essentially it's essentially where fresh water and sewer water meet. Where, where are those points? And I, I have to come up with a catchy, catchy media sound bite for it. Yeah, because it sounds like you want them to dis be disconnected. Correct, right. So they're essentially, we want to keep clean, clean, and dirty, dirty. So if it's, uh, if it's clean, can we move it to where, 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 where yeah, where are the good girls meeting with the bad boys or the other way around? Um, what, what is the connection point and physically in space? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I made a note of that. Um, does anyone else have questions for Imond on this? We'll be... Some of the some of the technical needs will just be coming on uh, as we develop. So, like the the need for the acoustic one just showed up last week. So, or actually no, we're, we're, it's just I my uh, daughter's classmates now are pointing out to me whenever they hear unusual sounds on the street. So, I'd be cool to have some kind of cool gadget to give them to test uh, with a reward based system. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I just want to say I think it's pretty cool. I'm new to uh, water monitoring, uh, but I've been t tuned into it uh, from a lot of the concerns in Vermont about where water's flowing, and um, especially from farm runoff and things like that. Uh, the you know the the nutrient levels that we're having ending up in our in our rivers and our lakes and our water sources is becoming more and more of a concern, and um, and so there's a lot of talk in the in the farming community trying to figure out um, how how can we both um, monitor our um, our own water systems. So you know, for our, like, how do you align the farmers' uh, interests and the public's interest? So the farmers want to know if their nutrients are running off the land, and the and the public wants to know if the wants to know that as well. Um, so trying to figure out like a nice balance between those two. So understanding how water flows is a big <clears throat> is a big deal. And um, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not an expert and I'm still just uh, reading about this. So it's really cool, uh, I mean, to 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 see the the work that you're doing. It just seemed like such an interesting, impossible task, and you guys are getting it done. It's really inspiring. One cool. Um open source resource you can have for Vermont is a lot of the states have started uploading their LIDAR data. Uh, some of it is coarser than others, some of it is very high resolution. But QGIS now has a little uh, hydro routine built into it that you just upload the LIDAR tile that you download for free off the state website and then you run the hydro flow routine and it gives you essentially the projected flow of the water across the landscape uh, from the farmers fields to the river and the huge logistical advantage that it gives you is that the blue line it traces across the landscape will pinpoint certain spots along the river where there will be heavy phosphate loading that are not necessarily immediately obvious so I found that the number one thing when I want to find out if there's runoff from a site is I try to find the LIDAR and then I run this QGIS flow routine and uh, then I cross-reference that with the historical maps and landfilling changes to try to understand who did what where. So what will often typically happen is uh, over time stream beds get filled in with hilltops and that's where all the garbage goes. So this is a good way to figure out also where people have dumped stuff 
because typically the areas that um, the LIDAR shows closest to the river are the areas most likely to have had pollutants stuffed there, because that was just a historical routine. You wanted to get rid of swampy landfill, these swampy stream bed areas, and that, that's invariably where in the 1870s they got rid of their barrels of stuff or whatever it was they were getting rid of. That's a great example of uh, some low-hanging fruit there. Thank you. And then the other marker that I use for Vermont is, especially if you have rail tracks, a lot of the old rail beds followed this because they couldn't make the trains go up particularly steep grades. They're actually a very useful marker for um, old landfilling uh, because they were typically on the old floodplains, and to make the mm -hmm. rail build in, they would build in on the old stream systems. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So if you see railroad spurs, it's often a you know flag it as a marker for issues of water pollution. Uh, Thank you. Very cool. Um, so we have it's only six minutes before nine, but I wanted to um, kind of quickly switch to even not only a different topic but a different type of topic. Because I heard from another member of Farm Hack last week about this this whole community, which are great partners to Public Lab, actually starting their own version of this call open hour that's bringing us together right now. And uh, so, RJ, do you know anything about that? Or yeah, we um, we actually just stumbled through our first one about an hour ago, <laughs> and. Uh, um, yeah, I think, uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're experiment. so we, we do these events all around the country where we, you know, have these in-person meetups, and, uh, we've always had a really, uh, awesome turnout, um, people who are really excited about being able to brainstorm together, and, um, we're hoping to bring that also online so that we don't have to necessarily go through all the... Uh, well, there's two parts of it. One, we don't by doing you know Google Hangouts, we we can we don't have to go through all the steps of having to plan an event. And second, there's these farm hack communities that are just like sort of separate from each other, and we're hoping to get the brainstorming and the ideas flowing between those communities. Um, so there's lots of you know lots of different problems that people are having all around the countries, and people are solving them. Um, you know, probably probably the same problem in lots of different places. And uh, being able to get those ideas to flow would be awesome. Um, so yeah, we're experimenting with that. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll we'll see how well it works. It takes momentum, I think. And uh, and also, you know, a lot of the folks in the farm hack community, a lot of a lot of a lot of us are really, um, you know, haven't been too much, too involved with uh, technology. So having a having a computer with a video camera on it isn't really something that a lot of people have. <laughs> um, which is the great thing about the in-person events. You see this like huge range of ages and um, and different skill sets. Uh, so it'll be, it'll, I think it'll turn into an interesting, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a certain type of person at the farm hack open hours. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, so that's, that's, that's that. We just tried our first one and um, uh, we had uh, two other people who figured out how to make it on the call, but we didn't make it easy for them because we like changed the URL for the on-air hangout last minute because we somehow lost the first one. <laughs> so I've got I made a little demo of the Fido, uh, you know, a little update on the Fido stuff I've been working on this summer, um, and it was sort of a test run. So, so if anybody wants to talk, if anybody wants to talk about farming, open source technology. Have you got any of the prototypes for the FIDO on a web page somewhere? Uh, that yeah, we got the big, we got the beginning of it started out. Um, let's see, get the URL. So I just posted it. I'll post it both places. There's a uh, the. The best example of the FIDO stuff so far is the video demo that I have. I'll post that here, too. Um, in the greenhouse that I was working in this summer. Very cool. 
Okay, great. Um, on a on a sort of metal level, RJ, um, I'm wondering if if you guys had the idea to maybe uh, take the the tech one notch by um, just having a call in line, like a phone number, um, that people could call in, and then um, what you're thinking about facilitation if you're mainly gonna like. Choose the topics ahead of time and set up people that you know have something to present on that and then do question and answer about what they presented, like how Public Lab did our earlier ones. Mm -hmm. Being that actually what's first needed is act just really and truly an open hour so that people can speak up that haven't communicated at all what they're working on yet and it can be more of a back and forth conversation the whole time. Uh, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, the that first idea of the having the uh, the call in number, I think that that is uh, that would be ide that would be ideal, especially for the folks who aren't great at using Google products. Um, I was thinking about I was thinking about looking at some other services other than Google Hangouts um, for for that reason, because I don't I don't think we can do that quite. On the uh, on the Google, we you can like call someone in if you have their phone number. I think on a Google Hangout. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, like if you like click invite, there's at there's an add telephone button, and then you can type in the phone number and it'll call them, and so that works that works well. But that's that's you know, I guess if you have it all sort of like organized beforehand, you have everyone's phone numbers. That could work. Uh, but okay. for like the more ad hoc like kind of thing, uh, it's nice to just be able to have some people jump in. But I think there's also like the one thing that I really like about the Hangout stuff is that you get the video recording afterwards for those who can't make it or had technical difficulties or whatever. Um, yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I. So I think you were saying before, like uh, as far as format, um, it being presentation based or conversation based, is that kind of what you're getting at? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, um, I would love to see it being conversation based. I think, like you said, that public lab started off with having a set agenda with people presenting. That's a good way to. That's probably a good way to bring people in at first, and and sort of kickstart the community and and the and the habit or whatever. And uh, so, so this this week was, you know, I was the headliner, um, saying like I'm gonna, RJ's gonna talk about his uh, Fido project that he worked on this summer, and uh, so I got I got that presentation in, um, but I really I really want it to be about conversation about uh, I'd love it to be as much of a farm hack, what we have in the in person farm hack events uh, as possible. You're trying to spark new ideas rather than just present the ones you've worked on. Is that sort of the goal, where we just come up with completely different off-topic things, but then come back and we find a new idea to develop the product you already have, or some something more random is what you're yeah. hoping toward. Yeah. So the event the event starts off the event start off with people talking about the farmers talking about problems that they have, and then then people. Kind of, then people sort of grab it. Then people sort of like uh, join the groups. They figure out a whole bunch of problem groups, and then they uh, people gravitate who want to talk about those problems gravitate towards those groups. And um, so yeah, having um, being able to like find a problem. Maybe maybe it's that we need. Maybe what I'm what I, what we need more is uh, being able to figure out a problem to talk about rather than a solution at these things. Um, Interesting. Um, so that we've been playing around with this idea of um, in FarmHack of trying to focus content around problems statements, and um, uh, I mean it, it takes a lot of organization, but I, it's something that we're thinking about. And uh, so possibly having our open hours based around a problem statement. Um, but it's it's just an idea right now. It's definitely much easier to just find somebody to present 
And because, like, if you're going to have a constructive conversation about a, a set problem statement, you need to get that. You need to get a good group of people who are all about it. Um, but then, then I feel like the there, there's also an aspect of just like spontaneity, where like you don't know who you're going to get showing up, and you don't know what you're going to talk about. Um, but they're all going to have something to contribute. You know, they're all going to find each other interesting and. And that's that's benefit to its own. So, wow! Um, thanks for the meta, the dive into the meta there. I think that's fascinating. And um, would would you be the main person who Stevie and I should connect with about formats and things like that, or is it this other person who emailed us? Daniel Grover. Uh, yeah. Or Dorn. Um, so. Okay. Daniel Grover is our main organizer right now. Okay. Um, and Dorn is uh, the president of the board. And uh, I'm working on FIDO and, and trying to keep up with security updates on our on the website. <laughs> there. Um, okay, well, do we want to... So we, we're at our time... Um, uh, that we usually allotted. Does anyone else want to? Do we want to keep going? Does anyone else have things they want to share or things they want to say to each other? I was intrigued by uh, the idea of trying to define the problem statement. And there's this great quote in Ulysses is that our errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. And one way to steer the conversation is to say, how can we screw the project up and then repair it? And I'm just thinking out loud, what are the worst things you could do? Like in the case of the thermal fishing bulk, we were describing all having many parts and loose parts. That would be one definite way to screw up the project. And then the reverse solution, the form of discovery, is finding out ways to trim down the equipment to its absolute minimal parts to reduce the field problem issues. So I'm just thinking of a line of conversation that we just express the worst case scenario, and then that'll be <laughs> positive. Yeah. That's a great quote. Yeah, thank you. Well, great, guys. Let's wrap this yeah. up. And um, uh, Stevie's going to post this as an archive video of our of us <laughs> on the open hour page. And um, we are going to be switching to, since this is the first Monday in September, Public Lab's next open hour is not going to be for another month. So, um, so don't worry about next Monday night. But um, a month from now, most likely New York and Boston will be holding in-person events to go along with the online hangout. So um, keep an eye out. Because we bring food. <laughs> Digital food, you mean? No, actual actual food. Jeremy came last time, right? Uh, I'm not making. So, um, can we try for like two minutes since we're done with everything else? Can we try an alternative to Hangouts and see how you guys like it? I'll sure. try. Uh, so just click the link I dumped in the chat. Okay. And I guess we'll end Hangout and try the other one for two minutes. Sure. I'm probably going to mute my mic in the Google Hangout to let this experiment go. I think I'm going to close the Google Hangout uh, so that the next thing can take over.
Okay, so I'm now muted in chat B, and I went back to the Google Hangout. Um, I'm in. Uh, are yeah, you I'm just trying to get it to run here. I'll be there in a second. Okay, great. I'm going to... Yes, actually, I can hear you. I was just, um, I was talking. Okay. Where did that go? Sorry. Okay, I'm going on mute in chat, please. Hey, I'm in. I'm back in the Hangout for a minute. Yeah, um, hold on. Uh, just see why my Chrome isn't... I thought my Chrome, my Chrome was giving me a hard time. And I'll be right with you. Just, it's just installing now. It seems to have been like my version of Chrome. Weird. Okay. Give me a hard time. Get in there. Jesus, Chrome's 165 megabytes now? All right, sorry. What about ArcJ? Uh, the, the chat, B, okay, there, let's see if that works now. No. Where did you go? Why is it giving me this message? Chat B only works in a browser with web RTC support like the latest version of Chrome, which I just installed, so shouldn't it? Hmm. Sorry. Just having some technical hic hiccups here. Um, I'm in. Uh, what kind of computer do you have? I, I'm on a Mac. iMac 10.6, I think Snow Leopard. Yeah, should be should be fine, right? Should just kick in Chrome right away. Oh, let me just try 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 just with the root and see if that works. Oh, I, oh, I know why. Probably because it's kicking it on. Let's see this. And that should do it. Okay, I'm good. Okay, I think I've got it. Why give me a second? I'll be all yours. Okay, I'm good. Please share my web page. Yeah, allow. There we go. Okay. Okay, sorry, John. Hey. Hey, I'm good. <laughs> 